You're listening to Audiology. Support our work on Patreon and be sure to submit your requests for topics in the comments below. Gerald Lyman Kenneth Smith, born on February 27, 1898, and passing away on April 15, 1976, was an American figure known for wearing many hats. He was a preacher, a political organizer, and a voice for various extreme causes. Initially, during the tough times of the Great Depression, he emerged as a key figure in the Share Our Wealth movement, pushing for a more equal distribution of wealth. However, following the death of Huey Long, Smith's focus dramatically shifted. He moved away from talks about sharing wealth to rallying against communism, and eventually, his messaging took a darker turn into anti-Semitism. Smith became synonymous with the far right, notably founding the Christian Nationalist Crusade in 1942, a group deeply entrenched in such ideologies. In 1943, he went on to create the America First Party and even ran for president under its banner in 1944, though he garnered less than 1,800 votes, underscoring his fringe status in American politics. Smith was widely recognized and often criticized for his extreme views, including being a leading anti-Semite and supporting white supremacist ideologies. Despite the controversy surrounding much of his life, towards the end of his days, Smith ventured into a project that left a more tangible legacy, the Christ of the Ozark statue in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. This massive structure was built with funds he solicited through donations. In addition to this, he also kick-started the production of a passion play in the area, contributing to its cultural and religious attractions. Gerald Lyman Kenneth Smith was born on a winter's day, February 27, 1898, in the small town of Partyville, Wisconsin. His parents were Sarah and Lyman Z. Smith, and he had an older sister named Barbara, who was ten years his senior. His dad wore many hats. He was not only a traveling salesman, but also a preacher and a passionate speaker at patriotic events. He admired Robert La Follette. Gerald Smith once reflected on his early years, saying, We took it for granted that the word Christian was the companion for the word American. The Smith family later settled in the countryside of Richland County, Wisconsin. Here, Gerald Smith went through his schooling, starting in small rural schools before moving on to a larger institution in Viola. During these formative years, his father battled with pernicious anemia, a condition that plagued him through much of Gerald's childhood. Once his dad got better, the family moved to Viroqua, Wisconsin. It's in Viroqua that Gerald finished his high school education, graduating in 1915. Pursuing higher education, Gerald Smith went on to Valparaiso University in Indiana. By 1918, after two and a half years of diligent study, he earned a degree in biblical studies. Post-graduation, Smith joined the United States Army. World War I was raging at the time, but he never saw action overseas as the war ended before his deployment. Not long after, Smith faced a personal health battle with nephritis, an ailment that took him back to Viroqua for a period of recovery. Smith knew from the age of 12 that he wanted to follow in the footsteps of his family and become a Disciples of Christ minister. By 1916, while studying at Valparaiso, he was ordained. After overcoming nephritis in 1919, he started his pastoral journey with a temporary position in Soldiers Grove, Wisconsin, moving on to serve in the larger community of Footville and then establishing a new church in Beloit. It was after a trip to Chicago that Smith shared his first known opinions on racial mixing in a letter to his parents, describing it as terrible and saying it sickens one to see white and black people together in such a way. Following his marriage and another health setback, Smith took up a position at a more prominent church in Kansas, Illinois. His career took a significant turn in 1922, when a sermon he delivered at a ministerial convention in St. Louis brought him national recognition, leading him to a large congregation in Indianapolis. There, despite the widespread popularity of the Ku Klux Klan among Indiana's Protestant men, rumors swirled that Smith was affiliated with the Klan, especially in the wake of Grand Wizard D.C. Stevenson's conviction. Nevertheless, Smith spent his life denying these rumors. In 1929, after his wife was diagnosed with tuberculosis, Smith moved with his family to Shreveport, Louisiana, in search of treatment. There, he led the King's Highway Christian Church, earning the esteem of notable members of the community, including the city mayor and the president of the Chamber of Commerce. During his early years in Shreveport, Smith embraced an ecumenical approach, preaching at B'nai Zion Temple and inviting the temple's rabbi to speak at his own church. 
After moving to Shreveport not long after the stock market crash in 1929, Smith started to dive deeper into the political scene. He took on the role of chaplain for the Louisiana American Federation of Labor and even gave the main speech at a meeting for the Louisiana chapter of the American Bankers Association. He also took to the airwaves, preaching about the need for social change and calling out the Standard Oil Company in his radio sermons. Soon after settling in, Smith bumped into Governor Huey P. Long, who had a law office in the city. Their friendship grew, but it also led to Smith having to leave his church in 1933 because many of his congregation didn't see eye to eye with Long. After stepping down, Smith seemed to shift gears politically, reaching out to figures like William Dudley Pelley and even trying to get in touch with Adolf Hitler to talk about what he saw as Semitic and anti-German propaganda. In 1934, Long set up the Share Our Wealth Society, which aimed to put caps on how much wealth and income a household could have. He picked Smith to spearhead this initiative. O. Smith had a clear vision for his campaign, stating that to make a mass movement take off, it needed to be simple for quick attraction, deep-rooted for lasting impact, uncompromising for assurance, and actionable. Traveling the country, Smith's speeches for Share Our Wealth attracted both followers and critics, reminding some of a fiery preacher mixed with a charismatic salesman. In 1935, he boldly claimed to a journalist that he might duplicate the feat of Adolf Hitler in Germany, and he tried to convince Long to run against President Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1936. However, after Long's assassination in 1935, Smith's attempt to take the reins of Long's political group in Louisiana fell flat. He found himself politically isolated, pushed out by figures like Seymour Weiss, and lost his job with Share Our Wealth before the organization itself was dissolved. After leaving Louisiana, Smith took part in the campaign in Georgia supporting Governor Eugene Talmadge, who was known for his white supremacist views and planned to challenge Roosevelt for the Democratic nomination in 1936. Smith then headed to New York City to join forces with Francis Townsend, a supporter of pension reform. He mistakenly thought Townsend had access to a valuable mailing list. Despite initial reservations from Townsend's team, Smith eventually won Townsend over. In November 1935, Smith persuaded Townsend to team up with Charles Coughlin, a priest opposing Roosevelt, to endorse William Lemke for president as a stand against what Smith described as the communistic philosophy of some of Roosevelt's advisors. As the 1936 election campaign was winding down, Smith declared his intention to start a movement dedicated to fighting communism and taking control of the U.S. government. He claimed he had the backing of 10 million patriots ready to die to stop an international plot to collectivize the United States, along with wealthy backers who promised to donate 1% of their incomes to ensure America became vigorously nationalistic. However, Townsend quickly distanced himself from Smith, and Lemke's campaign manager kicked Smith out of the Union Party despite his objections. Coughlin, on the other hand, stayed out of the fray, having already grown a dislike for Smith during the campaign. In the fall of 1936, Smith went back to Louisiana to join ex-Governor James A. No in speaking out against Governor Richard Leach's new luxury sales tax. This tax was meant to help fund Louisiana's contribution to the National Social Security Program, but Noe claimed Letch had betrayed their state to curry favor with Roosevelt. After a controversial radio talk in New Orleans on October 22nd, Smith was punched in the face. On the eve of the election, he was arrested for causing a disturbance and speaking offensively on statewide radio, while criticizing Leach. Despite their confident claims, Smith, Townsend, and Coughlin's union ticket ended up garnering only 2% of the national vote, mainly from Catholic areas where Coughlin was still popular. Within two years, their political party had disintegrated completely. As tensions in Europe increased due to the rise of the Nazi party in Germany, Smith looked to team up with the America First Committee, which preferred the United States stay out of Europe's conflicts. However, he wasn't successful in forming an alliance. By 1943, he went ahead and established the America First Party, essentially taking the committee's name for his own use. Around this time, he also joined forces with the fascist Silver Legion of America, led by William Dudley Pelley, a group inspired by Hitler's own supporters. Pelley, who was sentenced to prison in 1942 for breaking the Espionage Act, but then acquitted in 1944 on another charge, was a key figure alongside Smith. Smith, speaking to his followers, 
made his controversial intent clear by declaring their goal to remove Franklin Delano Roosevelt, whom he disrespectfully referred to as that cripple from the presidency. After relocating to Michigan, Smith attempted a political career by running for the U.S. Senate as a Republican. Unfortunately for him, he didn't make it past the primary election. Later in 1947, the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith identified Smith's group, the Christian Nationalist Crusade, along with other organizations like Merwin K. Hart's National Economic Council and the Ku Klux Klan, as major anti-Jewish groups with considerable influence and resources. That year, Smith also moved the CNC's headquarters from Detroit to St. Louis. In his political career, Smith made several attempts at becoming president. As the candidate of the America First Party during the 1944 election, he managed to secure 1,781 votes, mostly from Michigan and a few from Texas. Four years later, he garnered only 48 votes while running with Harry Romer for the Christian Nationalist Party. His final attempt was in 1956, earning just eight write-in votes in California. Glenn Jinson, a biographer, commented on Smith's motivations, saying that Smith's political ambitions were driven by a desire for power and compounded by an inexplicable, deep-seated hatred for Jews. He hinted at Smith's obsession with the presidency, despite his controversial and divisive ideals. Back in 1946, there was a case involving Smith who landed himself 60 days in jail. This was because he didn't behave properly in court during a trial in Illinois. The trial was about Arthur Terminiello, a Catholic priest who got into trouble for making hurtful remarks about different racial groups. In the early 1950s, when Anna M. Rosenberg was picked for a significant role as Assistant Secretary of Defense, the Anti-Defamation League pointed out that some folks who weren't too fond of her were giving her a hard time about her loyalty. These critics included some pretty notorious figures like John Rankin, Benjamin Friedman, and Gerald Smith. Smith, in particular, found himself up against a strong wall of opposition for his activities around Los Angeles, with different community groups, including Jewish and black organizations, standing up against him. There was even a newspaper article that dubbed him the Little Fuhrer. Fast forward to 1956, Smith threw his weight behind a fierce campaign against a law meant to better the mental health system in Alaska, which at the time wasn't a state yet. This law was actually supported by many, including the conservative Senator Barry Goldwater, but Smith and his associates called it the Siberia Bill, falsely claiming it was a communist scheme to lock away and brainwash Americans. Smith's political stance shared through the Christian nationalist movement was extreme, calling for the deportation of Jews and African Americans. They didn't stop there. They also directed harsh criticism at Catholics, President Dwight D. Eisenhower, and more. One of their publications, The Cross and the Flag magazine, spread a false claim in 1959. They said that the six million Jews reported killed in European death camps during World War II had actually moved to the United States during the war, a false narrative aimed at diminishing the Holocaust's truth. Gerald L. K. Smith chose the picturesque town of Eureka Springs, Arkansas, as the spot for his retirement, where he not only purchased but also refurbished a mansion to call home. In 1964, with aspirations high, he embarked on an ambitious project to build a religious theme park on his land, which he had envisioned naming Sacred Projects. Despite having just $5,000 at the close of 1963, Smith remarkably managed to gather $1 million by the following spring to kickstart the Christ of the Ozarks project, as mentioned by his biographer Glenn Jean Sohn in the book Gerald L. K. Smith, Minister of Hate. Though Smith's grand vision for the park wasn't fully realized, by 1966, the project's focal point, the Christ of the Ozark statue, stood tall on Magnetic Mountain. At an impressive elevation of 1,500 feet, the statue majestically looms over the town. The statue was crafted by Emmett Sullivan, who had previously honed his skills working with Gutzon Borglum on Mount Rushmore. Smith originally dreamt of recreating an ancient Jerusalem in the surrounding hills of Eureka Springs, but that part of the plan never materialized. However, he did bring to life an annual outdoor passion play, taking inspiration from a similar event held every decade in Oberammergau, Germany. This play is performed in an amphitheater near the Christ of the Ozark statue, delighting audiences multiple nights a week from the end of April through October. Thanks for watching. Share your thoughts in the comments and subscribe for more content.